Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm Stephen, your host for today, and I'll be speaking with Professor Philip Bullman. Professor Bullman is the Ludwig Rosenberger Distinguished Service Professor in Jewish History, Music, and the Humanities in the College and an Associate Faculty of the Divinity School. An ethnomusicologist whose work keeps him close to musical performance, he's the artistic director of the New Budapest Orpheum Society at the university, teaches and conducts workshops at the University of Hildesheim in Germany, and has won numerous awards, including the Noah Greenberg Award from the American Musicological Society, the Donald Tubby Prize from Oxford University, and just a few weeks before we spoke, he won the Balzan Prize, the first ever awarded for ethnomusicology. He's here today to talk to us about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Professor Bowman, welcome to the course. It's wonderful to have you. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, so uh, you are an ethnomusicologist at U Chicago. Uh, could you just start off, please, by uh, telling us a little bit about your role and, in layman's terms, what does that mean? In layman's terms, an ethnomusicologist studies the music of the world. Um, it used to mean that that was all of the musics that were if you will, outside the Western concert tradition, the European concert tradition. But increasingly, it means really encompassing all uh, musics of the world, uh, including uh, various classical musics. Um, we do so by employing also um, social science technologies and resources, uh, very much anthropology, and, and sometimes the field is even called the anthropology of music. All right. Thank you. So, you know, I, I want to hear more about uh, the field and, and your your work today and uh, also about how you got into it. But um, I'm going to start off by going even further back. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, what you were like as a kid, uh, maybe like middle or high school age? And uh, at that point, were, were there any signs that you were going to enter uh, this field? I grew up in a small rural farming town in, in rural Wisconsin. Um, in which I was the, the town musician. Um, I was a church musician at two churches, and I played in the band and, and piano and um, sang and did all of those things. My career goal really was to be a geneticist. Um, what was important, however, was the inclusivity of of that kind of musical life. Uh, and that's what drew me back to it, to what would become ethnomusicology eventually. The fact that that I was actively engaged with the music of all people in a particular community, not just um, those who would be part of an elite concert tradition. Interesting. Um, I'm just kind of wondering like what that's like for a, a young kid to be like a, a central part of a, a community like that. Well, it, it means that in addition to doing all the other sorts of things that, that, that kids might do, working in this school, uh, schoolwork, um, having jobs, being active in, in, in sports, that one played in all sorts of ensembles, one was engaging with people musically on all sorts of levels, uh, whether that would be in, uh, again, um, in, in, sacred services in, 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 in a small town, um, which, which were very intensively involved with music, um, mm -hmm. or playing in, in, in uh, wind bands and touring with, with high school uh, ensembles. Uh, I was fortunate to be in a, in a town, a little town called Bosco Bell in Wisconsin, um, in which we were actually one of the finest ensembles in, in the Midwest and uh, indeed uh, throughout the United States. All right. Very cool. Thank you. So um, how did you come upon the field of ethnomusicology? I mean, I, I know that you, um, you know, in a sense may have been <laughs> like already interested in it before you came across it, but um, when did it sort of dawn on you uh, or when did it become apparent to you that this was a field of academic study? I took my bachelor's degree in piano performance uh, from the University of Wisconsin at Madison um, and then started graduate studies um, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And in the, my very first semester, I had a course with arguably the most significant uh, ethnomusicologist of the 20th century, Bruno Nettle, a course on folk music. 
And I was so moved by the ways in which he talked about uh, listening to the voices of common people, uh, letting them express their ideas, their worldviews through music, um, that I was immediately swept up with, with the possibility of, of broadening my understanding even of what music was through the field of ethnomusicology. Interesting. So, I mean, was there a, uh, a sort of turning point for you where you decided to focus uh, less on performance and more on on the study that you just described? Or like what, what led you to pursue that, um, you know, at a higher level? Uh, the, the, the very fact that that I I found myself drawn to it. Actually, I began my my graduate studies in piano. And I was fortunate to be able to continue studying piano uh, throughout my graduate studies at the University of Illinois. Um, I'm active as a musician today in a different way. Uh, my wife is a pianist um, professionally. Um, she taught at the University of Chicago um, until her retirement. Um, so so it, was a, it was a moment of deciding that what I really wanted to do was to to think through music, to, to, to listen in different ways. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, so, um, just to lay, uh, a, a little bit more of the, the groundwork here, uh, could you just quickly, uh, take us through your route to U Chicago? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned your undergraduate study, um, between, uh, between that and where you are now, uh, you know, what different institutions have you studied at, um, or, or been a part of, um, and yeah, just walk us through the, the course of your career. Well, let me start, uh, I suppose, from today and, and work backward um, very quickly. Uh, I've taught at the University of Chicago for 36 years. So so, so this has been the bulk of my career um, um, and really the what I claim as, you know, the, the, the place where I've worked most. I did, however, start out by teaching in a number of different places um, in in, in, in uh, successive years, um, as well as certain types of postdocs as well. Um, I had studied also uh, for two years at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, eventually writing a PhD dissertation on, on, on Israel. Um, and then I had a series of uh, shorter term teaching positions, uh, two years at McMurray College in Jacksonville, Illinois, um, a visiting position at Berkeley, um, a postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell, um, a year teaching at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And then I came to Chicago and I've been here ever since. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Um, so, Looking back, I guess, uh, to your early career or even, you know, to getting your PhD and, and when you were getting started, uh, can you just talk a little bit about um, who supported you through that and, you know, what some of the, the challenges um, in that stage of your career were that, that you had to overcome? Well, some of the challenges really had to do with a moment in the history of ethnomusicology in which it was just coming of age as an academic field in American universities. Its strongest earlier position was in um, public universities, land-grant universities, um, because it resonated with the, the, the mission of land-grant universities. Those, those state universities in the middle of the 19th century were given a grant of land um, to develop. We usually know them because they're named after the state, the University mm -hmm. of Illinois, for example. Uh, University of Wisconsin, um, and um, the, the the challenge was to find the ways in which ethnomusicology, which looked beyond the Western art music tradition, could fit in departments um, and programs in academic music that had emphasized Western art music. Uh, it was a difficult challenge. Um, I was the first ethnomusicologist at the University of Chicago. Uh, for example, um, there are universities that are just now um, private university, private research universities that are just now establishing positions in, in ethnomusicology. That said, um, I would argue it is the, the growing field within academic music studies and, and has been for, for at least since the, 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 the turn of the century, since 2000. That's interesting. And, uh, you know, I want to hear more about uh, the field and how it's evolved, but uh, I'm also just curious from your perspective, 
And I'm trying to think now back to the other people that we've interviewed, uh, if there's anyone else who has been the first in their field who we've spoken with. Uh, I mean, I remember speaking with uh, someone from the uh, Games Lab, which I know is a, a relatively uh, new endeavor at UChicago. But what was it like for you to be uh, the only person in that field or, you know, the, the first one hired? Um, what was that like for you? Uh, it was exciting, first of all. Um it was it was quite exciting I, I i must say it was a challenge that i embraced um i never felt isolated in the university and and the reason i never felt isolated in the university is that my field of ethnomusicology immediately interacts with the area study centers uh middle east right. uh, asia uh east asia uh, I, I had immediate Jewish studies. I immediately have colleagues across the entire university, and they were very interested in assisting me um, and, and, and helping me when I would develop new courses, for example. Um, and so I didn't feel isolated in that sense. Uh, it was not always... Um, it took a while for ethnomusicology to be better represented in the music department at the University of Chicago. Today we have, four, we have, I, I have three wonderful, we're four in total, three wonderful uh, colleagues in, in, in ethnomusicology. And, and we have absolutely fabulous students uh, working in ethnomusicology um, and taking our courses in ethnomusicology from throughout the university, which is, which is also a reason we don't feel isolated. Um, when I teach a course on music and religion, students from the Divinity School take it, for example. And I taught a course on the Eurovision Song Contest um, the past spring and students from the um, uh, Department of Theater and Performance Studies. Um, and so when I taught this course on the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, students from that department take it, take the course, and I'm interacting. So our, my classes are filled with students from across the university. You know, yeah. How does one teach about Eurovision? What, what is there to be learned from, from studying the Eurovision competition? Well, um, there are the, the the very simple historical issues that and and political issues that that arise. The fact that this is the oldest and most important and uh, musical competition on on television in the world, it's broadcast by the Euro European Broadcasting Union since 1956. Um, that it is it is deeply embedded in questions of nationalism. Um, mm -hmm. As an example, uh, Ukraine won this year. Um, right. uh, as, as, as just one example of, of the importance of, of, of the politics of nationalism. How do I teach it? What I do is I cover the full range of, of historical issues and questions about gender and and identity of, of po the politics of performance. Um, and we, we, we work on, on, on this throughout the, the, the course, uh, exploring the, the, the different years historically. And, and then um, always I, when I teach it, I teach it in the spring at the time of the, the May uh, grand finale, um, uh, which is when the, 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 the winner is, is chosen. Um, and then at the end of the course, um, uh, the, the students themselves get together, organize into uh, groups and perform their own Eurovision Song Contest, which we simply call Chicago Vision. <laughs> that sounds very fun. Um... And we do this on, in, the, in, the, in the performance penthouse of the Logan Center. <laughs> okay so is there is there a performance element to a lot of uh what you teach or a lot of the way you teach or is um is this sort of an outlier um there's quite a bit of performance element quite a bit of a performance element in in, in my teaching and in the way we think of ethnomusicology at the university of chicago uh we have ensembles for the middle east uh south asia an afro-cuban ensemble um, that that are very pedagogical uh, as well as 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 performance oriented. Um, I myself am active as the artistic director of the humanities division ensemble in residence, a Jewish cabaret ensemble called the New Budapest Orpheum Society. 
Um, and performance has been very much a part of my own interaction with the field and with our with our students, um, and many of whom are outstanding performers, uh, whether in South Asian music or Middle Eastern music, um, or, or 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 other musics uh, that they they learn and develop um, skills within. That's very cool. Um, for uh, some of your colleagues, and we've just I've just been asking generally, you know how. Uh... How has your international experience, you know, affected your career or changed you as a professor or as a researcher? Uh, your international experience is extensive. I mean, it seems like that's a, a huge part of what you do. So um, what are a few international experiences uh, that you've had that you found, you know, were transformative or, or just something that you feel um, really helped you grow uh, as an ethnomusicologist, uh, as a as a teacher? I mean, um in any way, really. <laughs> what, are, what are some of the highlights? Sure. Um, one of the things I can say, so I, I, I speak and, and write in, in German. I'm, I, I, um, it's a second language for me. Um, and, and therefore, I've taught widely across Europe um, in, in German, um, not only in German, um, and, and, and elsewhere uh, for for many years, um, and, and and regularly, I I, I hold a, an honorary professorship in Hanover, um, and I teach uh, I lead workshops there every every summer. I um, and 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 I and I, and I have a, a a second home in Berlin, um, but I also do research with colleagues. I work closely with colleagues throughout the world. Um, I've been with a with a wonderful co-editor Federico Cialistini. I've been editor, co-editor of the Journal of the International Musicological Society. Um, it's just an example of, of international work. And we publish in five languages, for example. Um, it's the leading journal of the of the most international music society um, in, in the world. Um, and I work on projects in other places. And this is where where the area studies centers at the University of Chicago are particularly helpful, such as the East, the East Asia Center, uh, the Hong Kong Center, where um, just this year I've been uh, working on the, together, contributing to some of their programs with a few book launches um, and with a with a webinar on jazz in China. Uh, um, we have a major project at the, at the Delhi Center, a group of colleagues on, on, on this called Interwoven. It's a study of music and sonic and, and, and architectural and artistic uh, cultures in the Indian Ocean world. Well, perhaps I, I've spoken at some length here, but maybe I'll just say one thing in conclusion, uh, is I myself write in other languages. And this is one of the surest way for anyone in any uh, national tradition to become international, because you're writing for an entirely different group of readers. Mm. Um, uh, the argument is often made, well, why does one have to do research in any other language than, than, than English? Because it's uh, sort of the lingua franca of the world. And I would argue against that. I would say you, you, you reach only one group of readers uh, by doing so. When I publish books in German, I have entirely different readers um, uh, whom I reach. Uh, when my, my books on world music are translated in, into, into Chinese and Arabic and Ukrainian, they reach, they reach other audiences, um, they reach other readerships. Um, so that, so I would, I would, the, the process of becoming international is one that one pursues, one develops, um, and in my opinion, it's it's the finest thing that we can do in the humanities is is to allow our our international reach to grow and to influence more people. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, just you know, before we started recording, uh, you said that, that you yourself have conducted a lot of interviews. Uh, what does your field research look like? Uh, it can look like um, look very different depending on the type of field research I do. Mm -hmm. So I do what might be called traditional anthropological research, in which I I I work in. I go to a particular area or a region. 
um, let's say, the Carpathian Mountains, uh, where I did an extensive research project uh, some years ago. Um, and I, I, I work really on the ground with, with communities and with individuals and with musicians, but those who, but, but those who live there. It's a more traditional kind of uh, field work in which one is intensively doing, uh, doing interviews with, with those who are part of, 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 a, of, a, of a local culture or a regional culture, for example, um, performers of a particular repertory. At the other extreme, um, I do research that um, focuses on institutions and, um, and, and modernity, especially urban modernity, uh, in which my, the, the research that I do often involves working extensively across the, the sonic landscapes of a city or of uh, uh, of a particular area in, such as Kolkata I, I, in, in India, uh, where I've done a lot of research um, and and published about its urban traditions as well. So I'm interested then in the inter interactions. And there's a case where I'm not so much uh, doing individual interviews with musicians as coming to understand the history of, of modernity, uh, the ways in which difference and diversity interact and, and, and create the sounds of the 21st century. That sounds really cool. And uh, I, I wish that we could just spend a half hour uh, talking about the sonic landscapes of cities. <laughs> that sounds really interesting to me. But um, uh, getting back, uh, you know, to, to yourself and, and your uh, job, uh, which it is, uh, you have described a, a very a lot of elements of it that uh, it sounds like you really enjoy. Um, one thing that we have been asking uh, everybody uh, on the show is: uh, Are there any uh, you know not so fun parts of of being a professor that uh, if you could, you would uh, sort of just uh, do away with? Uh, academia has politics, mm. um, as we know, and those politics often create difficulties for younger scholars. Um, there's the problem of the lack of jobs, something which I bemoan that I can't help my my own students better than I do already. Um, there's the problem of, in recent years, of the challenges to the humanities, um, in which funding has been cut back to the humanities, um, and 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 we 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 struggle um, in the academic world um, in in ways that we 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 haven't before. Um, just the the funding of research projects is 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 often very very difficult in the humanities. Uh, there just aren't the resources available to us, um, and and this isn't this is not a fun aspect. Um, um, there are years when even I myself have applied for grant for a number of grants for for a very worthy project, and there just was funding for none of them. Mm -hmm. uh, this happens to students a, a fair amount, um, and and that and that unfortunately is not a happy circumstance. Yeah, I appreciate your honesty there. Um, so you know, and I've heard you, I think, say a couple of things that uh, would would make great advice, but uh, I will also ask you directly, um, for people who are uh, interested in potentially entering your field, uh, what advice would you give them? Um, open yourself. Open yourself to diverse sounds. Open yourself to diverse tradition. Engage in the issues, the culture of the moment and of the times. Continue to open. Listen beyond the traditions that you may have grown up with. Listen to sounds um, that challenge you. Uh, listen to the ways in which um, the the issues of the day, whether it's the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, actually become legible and understandable through 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 music, nationalism. Uh, uh, open yourself be willing to understand difference and to work with those individuals and communities that are in need of the, the types of things, the, 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 the sort of 
uh, understanding that an ethnomusicologist working with migration and refugees might be able to offer it that, that others cannot or do not. Briefly, uh, just, uh, I'm really curious when you say, as uh, you know, sounds uh, that challenge you. Uh, is there an example from maybe earlier in your career of, of something that you feel challenged you that you're really glad that you opened yourself up to? Uh, so I didn't grow up with um, a full tradition of popular music, certainly of European popular music, as in in the Eurovision Song Contest, mm -hmm. uh, being involved as I was. Um, and I think especially through my students, especially through the particular projects that I've under, un, undertaken that, that I'm, I'm now fully embraced, embracing the, the, the ways in which popular music itself, um, is, is that opening of, 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 of the, the field that, that I so often seek. Cool. Very cool. Um. Well, uh, yeah, just uh, oh, one last question, which is, uh, what is the most gratifying thing uh, about your job? When students finish their degrees, it's the most gratifying thing for me. When I read their dissertations, and I've read a lot of them, um, and, I, and I witness the commitment that they've had over many years uh, to solve problems, and when, when they... When, they're able to emerge as my colleague um, after years of being students. Um, it's it's incredibly gratifying and fulfilling. All right. Well, um, I think that's a great note to end on. Professor Bowman, thank you so much for joining us on the course today. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Professor Bowman, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the others. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. We'll see you around.